Welcome to Possibility Project. Uh, this is the 36th episode, which I just cannot even believe. Uh, today we're talking about what policies and programs will result in the just transfer of wealth. And as I said, if you are new to this community, um, or if you've forgotten that you might have missed some amazing episodes, please check them out on the website, uh, possibilityproject.org. We also have a YouTube channel, so you can uh, look at those as well. This is the third season. And then our friend Mickey Desai from nonprofit Snapcast, and he has another podcast called Inclusion Catalyst. Mickey also puts all of the recordings into podcast format, so you can listen to that. Um, his work is amazing, so if you're not aware of Mickey, I would definitely check him out and check out all the good stuff that he's doing. And um, my name is Heather Hiscox. I helped co-create a Possibility Project back to, in May of 2020. When everything was happening, we really saw um, a moment where we could make this a moment matter and we could create a community around more disruptive conversations because we saw some openings and some glimmers of hope and excitement around shifts and reimagination. And so it's all about, you know, how do we be better than normal? So what I do besides Possibility Project is I'm a co-founder of Pause for Change. I work with nonprofits, local governments, and philanthropic foundations to help them learn new problem-solving skills. I have a new book coming out in February called No More Status Quo. And then there'll be online courses that go with that as well. So that's what I'm up to. And I want to describe myself um, if you're visually impaired. So I am a light-skinned white woman with red hair and freckles, blue eyes. And I'm in a colorful blue room wearing a, a flowered shirt. And I also want to share um, that I'm coming from the land that was kept and held sacred by the Thonothum and Pasquayaki people. I honor these ancestral keepers of the land where I am now living, and I honor their descendants who continue to breathe sacred life into our earth. And I also want to talk about territory acknowledgments are just one small part of disrupting and dismantling colonial structures. And if you want to know what land you occupy or learn more about some of these conversations, um, definitely check out nativeland.ca. And when I'm done with this intro, I will put a link to all of these different resources and for information into the chat. So you can open up a whole Google Doc that will have all of these links to the website and other resources. Um, so I'm going to talk about what the goals are a Possibility Project. We really wanted a space to start to create a community. I know I'm not the only one that's frustrated with how everything operates in social impact work. So we wanted to bring folks together. Um, help you stimulate some new thinking. Some people arrive and they've never heard of these topics. Others are very well versed. Um, we want to explore collaboratively what's possible and then really start with ourselves with that transformation work. And it's all volunteer. Every single one of our amazing speakers has volunteered their time and energy. That's something I'm trying to change. So right now it's crowdfunded and I'm hoping to work with some foundations in the near future to have some additional support. So if you have any capacity to support this work, please make a gift or let me know which foundations you think would be interested in this. And I just wanna talk through our agenda together today. We're gonna to hear from our amazing speakers because that's why you're here. Uh, they're gonna talk about uh, the main two questions we always ask in every single episode. And the first is what's dysfunctional about this topic that we wanna disappear? And then what's emerging that gives us hope? Those are the two, two questions we always talk through. And then um, our speakers will just have conversation and we'll have time for Q&A. So in the chat, please keep it lively, make comments. You'll see me putting some takeaways, plus one, each other's um, ideas. Put resources, books, articles, um, folks that you really appreciate. Put all of that information in the chat and I will include that in the takeaway email. So within 48 hours, you'll get the full recording an email with key takeaways, links to financially support our guest if you are so inclined, as well as all of the resources that they have shared that you can check out to go um, in more depth in this topic. And we'll do, after Q&A, a little time for you to talk to other people in this community. We'll go to small breakout rooms where you'll have a chance to talk about what's really uh, resonating with you, standing out to you from what you've heard our speakers discuss. So that's the plan. That's the plan for every episode if you're new. And they happen about every two to three weeks-ish, because again, volunteer project on my end as well. So thank you for being here. So now I want to introduce our amazing guests. And you saw their very impressive bios in the reminder email. And we do introductions a little bit different. Um, on the show, we have our speakers just tell a quick little story about themselves, something that makes them instantly human because we know they're just fabulous in their work and personal lives. 
So um, I'm just going to introduce each of our speakers and then they're going to tell us a little story and we'll, we'll take it away. So we have Jennifer Njugana, who's COO of Common Future, Kanisha Raymond, who's directing programs at Startup Tucson, and Chuck Collins, who's at inequality.org. So thank you three so much for being here. It is such an honor to be able to share time with you and with this community. So Jennifer, you wanna take it away and uh, share your little story so we get to know you a bit better? Sure, thank you so much. I'm really excited to be here with everyone today um, exploring this, this critical topic. Um, again, Jennifer Dragona, um, Chief Operating Officer at Common Future. And um, my story or my info is um, just that I really love Halloween. I love Mardi Gras, Carnival. I love festive events that have a lot of music, just, just pure celebration. Um, and so I have participated in the New York City um, Halloween parade doing the thriller dance. Um, I have gone to Carnival in Barbados, uh, Trinidad um, and Tobago, um, and I've gone to Mardi Gras in New Orleans. Um, love it all. And so um, fun fact on top of that, I have two sons, two little ones, both under age three. One was born on Halloween. And one was born on Mardi Gras season. That was not planned, uh, but it, it just so happened that way. That's amazing. I love that. See, I never knew that about you. That's beautiful. I knew about your sweet boys, but how fun with their birthdays in alignment with your passion. That's so awesome. Kanisha. Jennifer, I need to come to a party. That's first. Yes. <laughs> Hi, everyone. I'm Kanisha Raymond. Um, I had to think about my fun fact, but this summer I became an instant mom is what we're calling it. I signed up for foster um, in 2021. I signed up for the foster to adopt program and I was placed children on June 14th. So we are 92 days in. My girls are 11 and 13. And I can tell you that parenting is hard hard every day, but I was born to ground the children. Like I am born for the discipline and the grounding. And my favorite words are you're grounded, no TV. Cause I like quiet, but also um, my little one told me the, the other day, she said, are you excited for me to be in trouble? I said, no, this is what I was born to do to sit you down and have that talk to you and tell you that this is not working. So now they just call me the no mom. Um, but <laughs> because that's how we wake up in the morning. Good morning. No, don't talk to me, but it has been a joy. Um, and we are going for adoption in January. Wow. That's so amazing. Oh, it just shows the size of your heart. And, um, I love that. How lucky are they to have you in their lives? Awesome. Awesome. And Chuck, let's hear from you. Hi everybody. Um, Chuck Collins. I, uh, I'm on Abenaki unceded land here in uh, Southern Vermont. And um, my three children are out of the nest, but uh, that doesn't mean we don't help them or see them. Um, but I had, I had one little funny just image maybe from the last day, which is maybe uh, some of you yesterday saw that uh, the Patagonia company transferred its well, you know, the owners transferred it to a trust that's going to be controlled by advocacy groups. And uh, so all of a sudden, my phone and messaging was lighting up uh, uh, with, you know, kind of interview requests and that sort of thing. But I came home in the dark and realized my chicken coop door had blown shut and none of the chickens were in the coop and it's dark. And one is just sitting on top of the coop and I hear them crying in different parts of the yard. So I have my headlamp on and I'm talking on the phone and I'm, I find one chicken hiding in this bush and bring it over to the coop. And, you know, you can kind of hear people going, what's that noise in the back? Oh, nothing, nothing. You know. Anyway, so uh, the good news is all were accounted for. I, I just in that moment had this horrible feeling like maybe one had disappeared or a predator had gotten to them, but they were all hiding on the porch and all their favorite hiding places. So I found them. So anyway, that's just a little window into my uh, rural life and uh, the riches of uh, parenting lots of chickens at this stage. 
I love that. You have chicken chicken babies now. Oh my gosh. And I, I just love the image of you like trying to play it cool, you know, scheduling a national high profile interview and you're chasing chickens around your house, trying not to let anyone know that you're doing that. That's awesome. I think we all live that life, right? Like nothing to see here, just chasing chickens. Just look right here. That's yeah, awesome. that clucking sound that you hear, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Never mind that. Never mind that. That's awesome. And, you know, with this topic, um, if you if you missed the last episode, definitely check it out. It's on the website. We talked about appropriation and reparations. And it, of course, is connected to this topic because we were talking about wealth and about power and, and topics like that with our amazing guest. And I thought, well, this is an interesting tie in or kind of follow on and continuation and some sorts of that conversation around wealth and around wealth hoarding and around, you know, what, what we do with access to capital and how do we have a just transfer of wealth in this country and beyond. So I'm so thankful for our guest today. And we're going to jump in with that first question of what's dysfunctional that you want to disappear connected to this topic. So Jennifer, do you want to start us off? I had a feeling you're going to call on me, <laughs> but, but all good. Um, you know, where to even begin? I, I think when we think about what we, the system that we have in, in this country, in the U.S., and even globally, we very clearly have a, an economic system that, quite frankly, just does not work for all. And, you know, we, we often use language, you know, like, the system is broken, um, but actually the system is working exactly how it was designed. Um, it was designed to create structure and, and hierarchy, um, you know, often based on race and gender and class and, and you know, other, um, you know, group descriptors. And, you know, it means we have a system where you have some that can barely get by with basic needs. Um, you know, we're talking about food, we're talking about rent, we're talking about gas and transportation, um, basic things that help us all in our, our daily functioning. And it's not due to, you know, their lack of willingness to work. Um, it's not due to anything like that. It's, it's based on this myth of meritocracy where, you know, we, we treat people who are wealthy as though they are the ones that should make the decisions around um, you know how how the system operates um, and it's time for us to change that it's time for us to rethink and and reimagine uh, different models that could work um, you know different structures that could work that really enable us all to be included um, in our economy um, you know, I think the other dynamic, so if that's the broader dynamic, there's also this piece where we all have a role as well. Um, you know, so much of it is, you know, us being a part of the status quo um, in our day to day as well. And so even posing this opportunity to ourselves and thinking about how can how can we make changes? How can we make shifts in our organizations, in our communities, and collectively, challenge the system that, um, you know, creates such and maintains such inequity. Mm, thank you. Yes, I, I one time on a, a talk with Nathaniel Smith, he was one of our guests, I had said that the system's broken. And he said, No, I'm I am interrupting you. <laughs> That is incorrect. And I was like, yes, I meant to say it was designed that way. Yes, you're right. But we, we just say that so it just glides off our tongues, right? So systems are broken, systems broken, but we really have to think about how it was designed and who it was designed for and who it benefits. So thank you for speaking to that. Uh, Kanisha, what would you say? What's dysfunction about you know our wealth and system that you want to disappear? Um, I think when we're talking about this subject, we have to go back to the system system being designed the way it was designed. But then if we go farther back and we think about how Black Wall Street was a big thing um, in 1921 and how it had grown generational wealth and Black wealth in that community. And then when you think about $1 in one community that spent over a hundred times and stayed in that community for one year, they were able to grow that wealth, but then it was burnt down, right? Then it was burnt down and we, that wealth was taken away. And then you go back to Wall Street and Wall Street is 
built on the backs of black people, also on the graves of slaves. So the system was built, yeah. Yes, and it was built for these certain amount of people, but how do we switch that up and change it? And as we're going forward and thinking about what's happening now, when you look at the numbers and the household, you see that most of the time, 12.68 trillion households, white households, make more than black households. And there's this big gap. It's about, I think it was about 10.4 trillion of this racial gap of wealth. And so when we're looking at the money and the wealth that's coming out, whether it's in housing or in in businesses, in money, however you look at it, like there's more than enough to go around, but if the system is broken in the space of we are not working the system to make sure we're getting something out of it, but we're also having to fight to get to the next step. So how do we change that when we're moving forward in the work that we're doing? And how do we make sure that we're making a ton of noise in these spaces to make people think about it and really reshape the work that they're doing because there's money out there, there's opportunity out there, but there's so many gatekeepers in this space that want people to kind of step back and listen. How do we step up and take up space throughout that time? Yes, yeah, so powerful. And it makes me think about Tommy Johnson who was a guest in the, in the last episode from Made With Black Culture. He talks about when people often discuss the racial wealth gap, the racial wealth dis divide, they rarely talk about the assets that black culture bring to the economy, that they're not just dollars and cents, they're assets that are multiplied and continue to create value, economic and social and structural value. And that is never accounted for. And I encourage you to check out um, that episode because he talks about the $15 trillion on an annual basis that black culture alone contributes to the global economy every year. And so it's just, I love his model because it's really trying to put a stamp on what is black made black culture to send that signal that it's not for co-optation. It is not for consumption without permission and without payment. So definitely check out his, his work and Chuck, please take us away. What would you say? Well, um, the, the, a lot of the work that I've been part of is looking at the system, the system by design, as Jennifer says, that extracts wealth and funnels it to the top and, and particularly looking at what's happening at the very top in terms of that, well, I call it the top one-tenth of 1%, 1 how much wealth is and philanthropic power is concentrating in fewer hands. Um, so um, in the last year, I've been part of a group that's looked at how the ultra wealthy are hiding their money. So we're kind of, we're in this period of hyper extreme inequality. Uh, we've always had sort of a gap between, you know, the 1% and everyone else. But in the last 40 years, we're sort of seeing like this accelerating concentration of wealth and power at the very top. Uh, sorry for the up and down metaphor, but, you know, in few hands. Um, and to be in that top 10, one tenth of one percent is like you know thirty million and up, right? So that's that's where huge amounts of wealth is flowing, and uh, that, those are folks who have the ability to hire professional. I would call them wealth defense industry. The people, the lawyers and the accountants, and who basically can figure out how to sequester wealth, keep avoid taxation, and create these kind of multi generational wealth dynasties. Uh, which are predominantly white concentrations of white family wealth. Um, and our estimate is that at the global level, we're talking about somewhere between 30 and $35 trillion of wealth held by this ultra wealthy group that's sequestered in trusts in offshore tax havens. It isn't even in the equation uh, of how unequal we are because it's not counted. Um, so that's one one really big piece of the broken system. It's that's not a sideshow. That's center stage in terms of what's going wrong. Um, and then I think that you know just within the U.S., there are certain states that have built industries around this wealth hiding sector. So we think there's about six seven trillion dollars in trusts just in about thirteen different states that specialize in changing their laws to help the ultra wealthy hide their wealth. And then finally, just on the, 
topic of philanthropic wealth, we're seeing a parallel sort of hoarding or concentration of wealth within the intermediaries controlled by wealthy donors, donor advised funds, private foundations. You know, some of that money comes in and goes out. Uh, that's the good news. But uh, what we're seeing is because philanthropy is becoming more top heavy, nonprofits, community organizations are more and more dependent on trying to get rich people to fund them. Of course, rich people have different giving priorities than than the wider population. So we see what 1.4 trillion just kind of warehoused, sitting on the sidelines in donor advised funds and private foundations that could be flowing and going to community organizations and the like that are doing work on the ground. So, you know, in terms of like the, the just, you know, uh, uh, lack of transfer of wealth, those are, that's a little bit of the picture that I see. And, um, you know, just to think that these recent, and this is really accelerating now in the last 15 years, they, they supercharge all the existing inequalities. The, the racial wealth divide is kind of supercharged by these trends. Uh, so anyway, that's, that's, I guess, the bad news or the disturbing picture that I see. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, I, I've never heard that term, the wealth defense industry, but ooh, like, yes, yes, like professionals whose job it is to just help people hoard wealth right? <laughs> and to and to preserve that wealth for a dynastic sort of rule, right? It's so fascinating. Okay, we're going to shift to then the more positive facing question. And what I tell all of our speakers is, you know, what, um, what would we want to see? You know, what, what's the reimagination? What resources do we want to share with one another? Like what actions can we all take as individuals, as families, communities, organizations, as global markets? Um, you know, what, what's emerging that gives us that hope? What can we all do and what can we look into to learn more? So Kanisha, do you want to kick us off? Sure. Um, I think when we're looking at, I work in capital, I work in small businesses, um, but when we're looking at this gap of wealth, it's looking at our bigger banks, right? We're, we're here in Tucson, it's a big but small town, um, and we're looking at how we can reshape the way that we are putting capital out in the community. And so we do that in a number of different ways. We have the BIPOC loan fund that focuses on BIPOC entrepreneurs and helping to get them money to get them started or to push them to the next level. But when we're looking at this, this national thing and how we can really change the system where the money shifts and how it comes out, we have to look at our bigger banks that look at the smaller numbers. So how many hours is it gonna take me to push out this $10,000 loan? Oh, it's not worth it. Or I'm not making my money back. But if you think about how we're pushing out the money and $10,000, is a big amount of money for our BIPOC community because they don't have wealthy friends and family that can give them money. So when we're thinking about how the finances and the capital goes out, it's really opening your mind and looking at who actually pushes the economy forward and how we can continue to help and back that. So I know a big, the biggest problem we have is that when we're going to bigger banks to get money out to our small businesses, they say, oh, they're not scalable. Oh, what if someone dies? Oh, what if they have children? They're going to shut down. That's one of our biggest problems that we have. But when you look at it, 67% of businesses are by women and 45% of those are by women of color because entrepreneurship is not always just, oh, I wake up and I wanna be an entrepreneur. Sometimes it's out of necessity and that's how they feed their family. So why are we not putting money into this community that is helping our economy, um, especially through 2020? And why are we not looking at different ways to do that? So I think that's one of the things that's coming out of this. And there's a lot of eyes right now and everyone's woke since 2020, right? We wanna make a change, but how do we keep that going? How do we keep the conversation going? And it's not just a conversation, it's the action behind it. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you for sharing those numbers. And I love that you called out that everyone's woke since 2020. And we've all just seen the backslide and the regression, right? Everyone's just going back to like 2018 or something is what I'm noticing um, in their actions and behaviors. A lot of those promises not being fulfilled and not seeing the actions. So absolutely. 
Yeah, Chuck, what would you say? What um, What's emerging that gives you hope? What are you seeing? What can we all do? Well, just um, I see an awakening, you know, just about the dangers of these inequalities, uh, how the game is rigged. I think more people, you know, uh, Jennifer talked about the myth of meritocracy, this, this kind of powerful narrative that everyone is where they deserve to be, you know, that kind of narrative. You can sort of see it cracking that people are just not buying it, resisting it, re retelling stories of how wealth is created and extracted and the harms of inequality. Um, so I think the combination of sort of the events of George Floyd and the pandemic have given us this crash course on how harmful inequality is, why it matters. Um, and, and then just to lift up, I think a couple of positive signs of the time. Um, Congress came within two votes in the US Senate, two wayward Democrats of passing a $4 trillion Green New Deal bill that would have uh, made the child tax credit permanent, would have paid for that with taxes on the ultra wealthy. And because of you know the Christian cinema, Joe Manchin, blah, blah, it didn't happen. But it's, it is important to realize just how close that came and that this Inflation Reduction Act that did pass really actually has some really important things in it. It actually is gonna assist, you know, uh, reduce some of these levels of inequality. And it's, it's about taxing the wealthy. Like two years ago, there was no discussion about taxing billionaires. And now there's a whole huge popular push around taxing the ultra wealthy that, that didn't exist. And in fact, the, the new legislation has money to enforce the existing tax laws and sort of shut down some of these shell games that the ultra wealthy are playing. So that's really positive. Uh, and there's a sort of similar effort at, at, at corporation, looking at corporations and their behavior. There is a push, there is an interest and appetite for reforming the charity system. Uh, we did a poll in July that found 82% of the population thinks if you get a tax break for giving a donation, you should move that money to a qualified charity on the ground within two years or five years at the max. None of these creating permanent multi-generational foundations and institutions that are controlled by the ultra wealthy. So there's, a, there's a, an appetite there for fixing the rules around philanthropy that didn't exist a couple of years ago as well. And then I guess I would say, um, you know, there are interesting things that I see like, like yesterday, uh, Patagonia taking a $3 billion company and putting it in a, in a uh, uh, socially oriented trust where, the, where that wealth will be deployed to address the ecological crisis. There's a whole group of wealth managers. I mentioned the wealth defense industry, but there's a whole group of wealth managers who are working with ultra wealthy households to minimize and redistribute their wealth and, and look at the harms that were caused uh, in, by the extraction of the wealth and use the money deployed in a way to heal the harms. Fascinating, interesting stuff uh, that I'll send some links around. So um, I, I guess I see this, 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 awakening and opportunity. And, but the most important thing is the undercurrent public opinion to public understanding is shifting and the tolerance for these extreme inequalities is, is uh, intolerance for inequality is growing, I guess you could put it that way. Yeah, that intolerance, <laughs> intolerance for intolerance and inequality, absolutely. Yeah, there are hopeful pieces, right? And and I, my question for you, I have a question for you also about some of the changes we can make. But Jennifer, I want to hear from you. Like, I would love to hear about what you're doing at Common Future and what you would recommend and what you're seeing. Yes, absolutely. I'm um, I'm excited about a, a couple of things. So the first thing is at Common Future, um, we are actually piloting um, a few different economic models that 
we believe could be field defining. And um, you know, what I mean by that is these are models that can be spread across geographies and across contexts. Um, you know, we're looking at how funding is traditionally provided in uh, BIPOC communities and we're turning it on its head. Um, you know, we're, we're doing a character-based lending pilot. We're doing a revenue-based uh, financing pilot where you know, we, we're doing this on terms that are not extractive in the ways that they usually are, that are not requiring, um, you know, all the things that are usually required in that disadvantaged BIPOC communities. Um, you know, we're thinking about worker cooperatives um, in the care economy. Um, we've heard a lot about, um, you know, just the the challenges for daycare workers who um, traditionally have been underpaid and their, their labor not valued and, and thinking about how do we put more power in their hands. We're thinking about community owned real estate. Um, you know, we know that there's great inequality in, in ownership um, and, and access to real estate. We're thinking about how, um, you know, succession planning could work in manufacturing. So as those, companies, um, leaders leave those businesses, they can be transferred within those communities. So we're thinking about a lot of different things creatively. We're taking the time to reimagine and, and test new ways of doing things and working to take these lessons to influence others, um, you know, in philanthropy and policy, um, in business um, and in other spheres as well. We're additionally, um, you know, piloting a, a policy entrepreneur program because we know that these this work doesn't just happen in isolation. It also takes the will and the power at the policy level. Um, you know, we know that there are often fights about strengthening government and weakening government, and the reason is because there is power in government solutions and, and with policy. Um, so those are some of the things that we're thinking about on the external front, and that give me hope. Um, especially as we talk more about these structures. I think the other thing that's giving me hope, um, and this is something that we're taking on internally, is thinking about the experience of workers, right? So we know there's this is a moment um, where there's a lot of conversation about things like the, the great resignation, quiet quitting, all those things. And what they reflect are workers, um, you know, exerting boundaries that traditionally have not been um, respected because of such a great power imbalance, um, you know, when it comes to employers and employees. Um, and so it, it's, it's been exciting to see this unfold. And what we're doing at Common Future is we're thinking about not just our external work, but the work that we have to do internally. So we've, we've posed the question, um, you know, on our operations team, for example, about how can we support our staff? We're primarily BIPOC, um, you know, in creating wealth, or if not creating wealth, certainly not exacerbating debt and really supporting our, um, you know, staff's ability to survive and thrive. Um, you know, one thing we're, we've done is a compensation audit. Um, you know, we've, we've gone to a four day work week, um, you know, not just from the perspective of, of thinking about efficiency and productivity, but thinking about what this frees our staff up to do, just having some of that time back, um, you know, in addition to thinking about how they show up to work. So I, I think this is a moment of great opportunity. Um, I know there's also discussion about how the, the tides are starting to shift, um, given the talk about the economic picture, um, you know, and how that could shift power back into the hands of employers, for example. But, um, you know, I think for all the reasons that we know, the, the pandemic, the, um, you know, racial justice kind of reckoning, if you will, um, it's, it's presented, um, you know, this opportunity for some of those power shifts. And I think it's a moment where we can all think about what we can do, um, as I mentioned before, in our communities and our organizations individually to, um, you know, maximize this, this opportunity to shift power dynamics for the long haul. Love that. That's so, so good. And I love all of the things that you're doing. And the most beautiful part I think about what you're also doing at Common Future is that you are publishing your learning and you've been doing a lot of that writing, like sharing what you're learning along the way. 
right? Some of the questions you've been asking, what's working, what's not? Like, what's next for you? I, you just exhibit um, so tremendously what a learning organization really is and, and leading the change and wanting to share this learning across the sector. My question that I would ask, and I'm gonna start with this question, but any questions you all have, please put them in the chat. Um, my question is, for those of us that work in social impact, right? If you're talking to a business leader in the community and asking for support for entrepreneurship dollars or to support programs, if you work in a nonprofit and you're working with a very wealthy donor to try to get like a gift, um, some support for your organization, and you know that you're operating within this broken system or the intentionally designed system that is severely fractured, what, how do you navigate, how would you suggest people navigate those relationships and those essential conversations? And it makes me think of the work of community-centric fundraising, right? Like, how do we call out and in some of these really wealthy individuals with whom we must interact and develop relationships, but with whom we need to really inform about the ways that they can move their wealth to more greater benefit, right? To repair some of those harms, as Chuck had mentioned. What advice would you give for how to operate in that tension? Chuck or Kanisha, do you have any initial thoughts? And then Jennifer will jump in with you too. Any ideas for that? What have you done? So I don't have a filter. That That's just the way I live my life. Um, oh, we love I it. live my life out and loud and I'm gonna call you out on your crap all the time. That is how it is. Um, and I feel like when we tiptoe around the situations and we try to make it feel better for other people, we're just holding them back. So I walk into the space like a white man with money, don't care, I'm owning my space, I'm showing up as who I am, and I'm gonna tell you why you're gonna give me this money and why you're gonna put it back into the community. I think that what we've seen is, oh, I'm gonna give you a couple dollars because I would rather spend my money over here because these people look like I want them to look, they're saying what I want them to say. But also you cannot slap your face on a newspaper and say, oh, I gave $20 to whatever organization and continue to get that notoriety. Because again, I'm gonna call you out on it. That is, what, that is what I'm here to do. I'm here to call you out on it. So as we're looking at donors, especially in the space of the BIPOC community, I mean, I work for Startup Tucson. We're an all female office. I am the only person of color and my beautiful redhead friend downstairs, we are the diversity, but we really try to make sure that we're reaching out to get diverse people in and really doing the work. And that took us some time to get there because we're at 2020, right? 2020 meant we shut down. So we took some time to do our own internal work. And now we're taking time to make sure that we're taking the steps to make sure that we're diversifying our space. But when we're looking at BIPOC money, especially for the BIPOC loan fund, and luckily I've been doing work with Common Future on our revenue-based fund. And so we really reach out to the community and tell me no if you want to, but I'm gonna call you on your crap each and every time. And I'm gonna tell you where your money goes and how it's not coming back into the community. And then I'm gonna tell everybody how it's not coming back into the community because I want you to see how you can funnel money back into the community instead of picking and choosing because people look like you or they're saying the right words that you want them to say. And I think one of the biggest things that we found is I'm gonna give you my money, but then I want you to say these things. These are the bullets I want you to talk about and cover. And so, and what I've learned is not all money is get money. So you can give me a million dollars, but I'm not gonna follow your whole outline of what you want me to do if it's not aligning with our mission, vision and values. And so you turn them down, you walk away and you keep moving. And so sometimes that means that you're losing out on money, but I think that good money is gonna come in regardless of how you look at it. Um, so we've been, really making sure that we reevaluate the funds that come in and who they're coming from. Um, I've turned down money over the last year, no problem with it, but I need to make sure that the money that's coming into my community for the things that we are championing are the same people that are championing the things that we are putting out. Because if not, we're just helping to recreate the system that's already disrupted. Um, and we are here to disrupt that system and make it better. love that yeah and and I, I thought about having an entire possibility project episode just about dirty money <laughs> it's like what is that dirty money who does it come from what do we do with that you know how do we reject it how do we call people out with, with that filthy filthy money that, that again is so laced with power and really ridiculous expectations for influence um, yeah Chuck what would you say like how do you have these different conversations 
Well, you know, I think if you can bring Kanisha along, that would be good. But, but I would say, uh, you know, my experience is I, I come from a privileged background. So I see that there's a spectrum of where people are. There's a, there's a, there's a group of donors and wealthy individuals who understood they, they won the lottery at birth or whatever. And they, uh, they understand how extraction works and, and how, what it means to not just give money, but give up the power around decision-making and return money to the communities from which it was, it was taken. And then there's other people for whom that framework is, uh, it's not there yet, right? But, you know, and, uh, and this isn't necessarily Kanisha's job or people of color's job, but as, a, as somebody who's like organizing peers, organizing donors, you need to basically have kind of like a, a spectrum of ways to, to engage people. So yeah, if you've got, if you've got people who are already there, you know, find, find ways to engage them. And uh, yeah, I, I think, but having other models, having stories and having people on the ground, people in community organizations speaking truth to power is, is part of, and then there's the sort of support and accountability to help. I mean that in a, how do I say that in a sort of pastoral way, how to help move, move money and I guess the other thing I would just say is my, my, my message to, to those folks is, uh, you know, come home, come take your money away from the shadows, bring it, you know, bring wealth back to the communities from where it belongs, come home, root, root capital back in place, uh, let go. That's part of your path of liberation. Uh, it, it, it's not just a renunciation. It's, it's, um, it's about how, to, how do you rejoin humanity? How do you become part of a community authentically? Um, so I think that, and again, I think the positive news is there's, there's sort of an openness there. There's some role models. There's people that can talk to their peers uh, and sort of move, move that conversation forward. Um, so I don't know if that's helpful, but that, that's my two cents on that. Mm -hmm. oh, I love that idea of like rejoining your humanity because that, that money is such a disconnect. You know, when I was working on the book, some nonprofit leaders and professionals would tell me their organizations are so white, their boards are so white, their donors are so white that the only time they engage with people of color is when they're talking to the landscaping crew at their house. And when I heard that comment, it, it just hit my heart in such a way that it's so interesting in the sector, the, the amount of disconnect between leadership and organizations and how white the sector is and how that does have such an impact with connection to humanity, with connection to shared prosperity and reimagining, reimagining what's possible. Yeah, thank you for saying that. Jennifer, what would you say? How do you have those conversations? Yeah, it's such a great question. I think one of the keys for us is has really been thinking about the ways in which we usually show up with scarcity mindset and turning that on its head, right? Um, you know, so we we operate in in this system, right? This is the water; we're all swimming in it. So it's thinking about how we've internalized the ways in which we approach um, a, a typical power dynamic, um, right? Um, you know, when you think about nonprofits, we hope that you'll give us funding. Um, we don't really do that work, but we'll start now because that's what you're funding. Um, that's what you're excited about. And we know that the key to really doing justice in this work with respect to, you know, racial and economic justice it is being empowered and it's having our own economic independence. And so we have prioritized that in the relationships that we have and um, you know, with those that we collaborate with. Um, so it means that we've prioritized multi-year general operating dollars because it gives us the most flexibility to make decisions and have choice. You know, we are a staff that is, you know, primarily BIPOC. We have lived experience in the things that we're addressing and working on. So we are best equipped to propose solutions. And, and we know those in the community who have, have those solutions as well. So, um, you know, we make it a point to show up in that way. And it has made a difference for us. 
um, you know, we're able to fund, you know, some of those ideas that I've talked about earlier, we're able to attract additional capital to support that funding. Um, you know, we, we have discussions in our staff about, you know, what it means to have power, right? Like that's something that we even shy away from thinking that we don't deserve it, or, you know, it's, it's, it's evil, we, we can't touch it. But there is something about having power and being empowered in this work and we leverage that. We've talked about the impact that it's had in our work, um, you know, through our writing and in conversation with funders. And I also recognize that, again, we've had this moment where there was a, a significant increase in, in openness to these conversations. We were already doing that before the pandemic and, you know, before, you know, people learned about racial injustice and have known about it for the two minutes that they have, right? Like we, this has been our whole lives. So we were already starting to operate in that way. And then we, you know, had a moment as well where we were able to accelerate those conversations because of the, the openness to it. And I think, what that means for us now is that, you know, we're continuing to, to chart ahead and, and, you know, continue on this path where this is just how we show up. This is just how we do it. This is, you know, the way that's necessary for us to really have the impact. And we actually do know best because, like I mentioned, we have that lived experience. So we, we talk in that way. I think, you know, to Kanisha's point, like we have choice. We can say no. Actually, that doesn't work for us or, you know, those terms you know, would, would mean this for our community partners or our staff, we're not going to go that route. Um, and we're able to, you know, additionally do some of that education that's required, you know, for people who, who don't know because they have been so far removed. So it's that combination. And I think at the end of the day, it's really recognizing that we're not going to continue to show up in scarcity mindset and we're prioritizing multi-year general operating dollars. That really gives us that flexibility. Yeah, I love that. And just reinforcing choice and that just it's how you show up. It's what people expect from common future. It's what you will get. It's the consistency of your values, of who you are. It's your lived experience, your lived values. And people just know when you interact with common future and your leadership and your staff, that's that's who arrives. That's the power that comes with all of you. That's so great. And I'm looking at the um, chat to see if there are other questions, but so a lot of you are making comments, which is great. Um, and sharing appreciation, which is wonderful. And then Sophia put changing the narrative around money lies. Uh, so curious about the light bulb moments for your team. Um, Jennifer and BIPOC entrepreneurs around this, like, yeah, that's, it's interesting when I, I used to teach entrepreneurship about a decade ago and in one of my iterations of my career, and that was the first couple of slides I would talk about is what's your relationship with money? How do you feel about money? Because we have to think about that if you're thinking about envisioning your future and how it ties to your, your individual path. So any of you want to speak to that? I think that's a really interesting question. Um, yeah. Anyone that wants to jump in? Kanisha, Chuck, Jennifer. Yeah, I'm going to jump in because I've been working with Common Future for a while. So I want to speak on the work that we're doing. When I met Common Future, um, working in the BIPOC entrepreneurship area, we had our first meeting and it was great. And I was like, okay, they say all the good things. Let me wait till the next one because you got it. The next one is where you're going to. And I left that first meeting and I was like, this guy is great. Eric is wonderful. Can't wait to work with him. And the next meeting, we sat down to talk about what we were going to do. And he said, Kanisha, how much money do you want? And I gave him a number and he said, oh, done. And I said, yeah, right, whatever. I'm going to walk away from this meeting. And he said, you're the first person that's ever given me this high of a number. And you've challenged me to meet it. And you've given me all the reason why your BIPOC entrepreneurs deserve it. And I'm going to go out and get it. And so for the last, gosh, I feel like we've been in this relationship forever, but since February, January, February, I met them last year till now we've been building out this program together. And when I say together, we're on the phone once a month, they've come here to work with us to build out this program alongside of CIC um, and the work that they're doing. I hate that they have Fridays off. I really hate your four day work week because on Fridays I wanna talk about it and I can't, <laughs> so it does hurt me. And then I am a part of their entrepreneurship policy program and we started that in July and that has been amazing in the work that they're doing and really working to change the system and 
flip everything on its head, but they are in this work and they are working to change everything that we're doing from policy and entrepreneurship to the revolving loan fund and the revenue finance space fund. But then they challenge us to do better as well. I mean, I work in the space all day, but every time I get on the call with them, I leave and I say, oh my gosh, what am I, what can I do better? And I think that is what they bring to the table. They really make us think about the work that we're doing and how can we think about it in different ways and how can we show up as ourselves um, and take action in this space. And that has truly reshaped the way I work and the work that I'm doing. And I'm excited about doing it every day, even though it's like crazy hard in this space right now, because, you know, 2020 happened and now we're like fighting to get back there. But like when we're thinking about our BIPOC entrepreneurs, it's thinking about, they always say the underserved and they're not underserved. They're serving the community and they're doing it well, but how can we shine a light on that? And I think when we were talking before I told you about people telling me, oh, you have the seat at the table, speak for them. And it's about giving them that space and giving them the seat at the table. I'm not here to speak for all. I'm here to speak for me and my space. So how can we make sure that we're bringing everyone to the table so we're not making our own tables on the side when we should be working as a community? Yeah, I'd, I'd love to jump in and um, thank you so much for that, Kanisha. I mean, you know, we've likewise had such pleasure working, you know, with you and, um, you know, and in both capacities that, that you've talked about. And, you know, I, I want to pick up on something that you mentioned, um, you know, around, around the language, right? Like the, you know, the underserved, the marginalized, the language that, you know, I like to use and that we like to use is historically and presently excluded, right? Because the things that we say, have power um, and they orient us in a particular way. And we know these things are not by accident or happenstance, they're intentional, they're systemic, they're long lasting, they have been you know, a part of the systems we have since their inception and they morph, they change with the, the solutions that we offer. So I think for us, you know, when we think about you know, these, these light bulb moments, we're not just showing up to offer a solution we've been really thoughtful about the, the systemic problems underneath why we need to offer a solution in the first place. And I think because of that, um, you know, it, for us, it creates an opportunity to be able to rethink and reimagine and question everything. There's nothing that's not up for discussion or not on the table. And so that's how, you know, we get to a space where, in addition, it, you know, it's twofold for us. It's, it's the, the work that we're doing externally. It's the work that we're doing internally, right? Because, you know, we, we're part of these norms and these habits and in, in the system and infrastructure. So it's incumbent upon us to rethink everything and realize that everything is on the table when we're talking about the changes that we want to see. Yeah. Chuck, would you want to add anything to that conversation around a narrative around money? The only thing I would just underscore is just how powerful that narrative of deservedness is. It is like, in my mind, one of the biggest boulders in the road to shifting this wealth dynamic. Because if people believe that wealth is distributed based on you know, that the, the rich people are there, have wealth because of some kind of virtue or hard work or, you know, the meritocratic mythology and other people are, don't have access to capital because they, they deserve to be where they are. If, if, so there's, there's all kinds of ways, I think, to disrupt that, uh, to challenge those stories, to, uh, you know, everybody, you know, and, and this goes to kind of engaging white people around help. Like my experience is people say, well, you know, I did this, I did this, I did this. There's a sort of um, self-justifying mythology around holding wealth uh, that, that's rooted in the, I did this, you know, story, as opposed to how, what help did you get? What was the web? What were the ways in which the wealth uh, extracted how did it come, where did it come from? Like asking those core questions. So I think that this, this, what's great about this conversation, Heather, that you've pulled us together is getting in there around the sort of 
stories of wealth and wealth creation. How does wealth come about? And getting white people to see, in my view, the web that made their wealth possible, you know, uh, as opposed to their individual actions, looking at the system and, you know, finding other people who can break those stories down, break those mythologies down and uh, disrupt that narrative. Because that, that to me, I just see how that plays out in the public policy space and in the bank boardroom, et cetera. So what's great is you're creating real lived experience uh, of people building wealth and, you know, in the context of the system of extraction and regeneration. So. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting. You make me think about, um, I often will visit different universities to teach students how to do empathy interviewing, especially in like business schools or other programs. And I learned really quickly that um, for, for many of these um, students, they came from very privileged backgrounds. And when I would teach them about the power of empathy and how to, how to really tune into active listening and empathetic connection, these students didn't really understand how they had arrived there. And so after multiple iterations, I started having them first read a three page article. And it was just an excerpt from Phil Duvall's book, um, Moving Up in a Getting By World. And I would, it, the, the focus of the three pages was how the middle class in the US was created. And it just outlines all the different policies in the United States that took place with the GI Bill, with all of these um, access to capital for home ownership and all those pieces, educational loans that were completely excluding right, folks of color and how that has really led to some of these giant uh, wealth caps. And once students read that, they could arrive at the conversation around empathy and connection and listening in a whole different frame of mind. And I found it to be transformative because they directly understood how they were able to sit in that chair and that their position in that chair was going to impact their ability to connect and hear others and to be able to co-design potential solutions with the stakeholders they were engaging with. So it, it really, um, it brings that to mind. So before we talk about and debriefing and hearing again from our speakers, this is the topic for the next episode. This is a working title. Um, Brooke, Dr. Pierce, and Milan and I are emailing feverishly. Uh, we have like 12 different ideas <laughs> for, the, for the title alone, and then I'll be crafting the description. But I wanted to share um, just the, the feel of what we want to talk about. Is, um, and it was really inspired by some of Dr. Pierce's work, um, and that, that's what we call Dr. Pierce. Um, just this feeling of we have so many skills and abilities and methodologies and ideas. And then we go, we go into community and we're like, here you go. This is what we do. Participate without identifying that the answers already live within the community members. Right. And so just, um, just hearing stories about, uh, what folks have experienced and how to support all of us as designers on October 4th to think about this more deeply. So I hope you can join and I'm going to put the link to register, um, into the chat let me do that real quick and speakers what i what i would love to hear from you is just what what is sticking with you you know what's something that you all discuss de-identified in your chat in your breakout room that you want to share and how do you want to you know kind of close this out of this conversation so whoever wants to go first please jump in and i just put the registration link in there for the next episode who wants to who wants to jump in and synthesize and then if you also want to um share anything in the chat about you know what is really sticking with you from your breakout room please put that but which of our speakers wants to share i can jump in um so one of the themes that came up in our group was around relationship right and you know when you think about those that do have power and do have privilege, um, you know, how do you engage in relationship um, in a way that is constructive and, and, you know, supports and leads to the changes that we want to see? Um, and I think what came up as well is the, the idea of the, the psychology, understanding their entry points, um, you know, understanding that there are indeed some who 
doesn't matter what information they have still do not want to see these changes, right? Like this isn't, um, you know, unconscious bias 101. Like there are real people that don't want to see a power structure change, but there are those who do. And so, you know, how do we engage in relationship and then have them pay it forward in their networks and their relationships? So that was something that came up. Um, and I think really understanding, um, the psychology, the motivations, the fears, um, you know, as, as people who have been privileged to not have to think about this, gain new understanding and insights. And then also not, um, you know, when we talk about that relationship piece in the education, you know, not um, burdening with the burdening those who've been most impacted to do all that education work. And so just, just thinking about those opportunities. And then this didn't come up in our chat, but I, I wanted to go back to um, what you were talking about, Heather, before um, you sent us to the chat and you were talking about, um, you know, this, this, this text in a book and, um, you know, how people not having thought about that before they read it. And I want to say that there is very much a role here for, um, for academic institutions, for, for academia, right? Because, you know, the business schools, the law schools, these are places where so many are taught theory and models. And a lot of the times those theories and models don't include the truth and the information around inequality. Um, I'm, I'm also a lawyer, as you know, I went, I went to law school and I remember being in, in property class and, you know, having these conversations where you know, students would say things like, oh, but the market will take care. And there's these assumptions built in that people have equal footing and power and, and can bargain, you know, at, at, at the same advantage point. And that's just not true. And, you know, professors didn't correct that understanding or, you know, there wasn't a passage, you know, in the, in the text that says, actually, you should also know, you know, about things like the, the GI Bill and all, all these barriers that were erected to specifically and precisely keep people out of the system that we're talking about. So I just want to highlight that there's this role for academia in this in this conversation and in the solutions. Absolutely. I'm so glad you brought that up. Yes, 100%. Yes. Well, Kanisha or Chuck, what are your parting words? How would you sort of synthesize what we've talked about today? Um, we talked about Chuck in our room and Chuck and all his trillions and billions and you blew everyone's mind, Chuck. You're amazing. Um, but how everyone has enough and we are not spreading out that wealth and how can we help to change and reshape the systems that are out there to kind of um, make sure that everybody has a piece and what we can do as individuals to start making that happen. Um, I think leaving today, I already knew that Jennifer and Chuck were amazing. I could do this all day with them. I wanna take you both for coffee, so I'm gonna get on some flights. Um, but also just understanding how people want to change and reshape the system. People showed up today to hear us speak, not knowing what was gonna come out of my mouth, but they showed up. And so that means a lot. Sorry, I had to cough. Um, but also taking away what I learned from both Chuck and Jennifer and seeing how I can put that back in our community to make sure that we are making a difference and reshaping the way we work. Um, I think we're already doing some of that, but really taking that knowledge back and putting it back into our community. So leaving today, I just hope that everyone can take what they've learned today and start really putting it in their lives first before they put it out into the community and then start working into the community because it'll have this bigger effect. Absolutely. And I have to give credit to Josh. Um, I think one of the ways we can do it, and then I'll, I want to hear from Chuck, of course, is how we use our own money. You know, uh, Josh introduced me to an investor, like a financial planner that only works, well, he doesn't only, with my stuff and with Josh's stuff and with other people's, it's like socially responsible investments. Like, I don't want my money invested in dirty places, right? So it can start with me. I don't have a lot of money, but I can choose where that money goes and in service to what causes, right? And in service to what investments. So it's something we all can do, even if we don't have very much. So thanks again, Josh, for that intro to that resource. Chuck, please uh, take us away. What are your parting words? 
I don't really have anything that ties it up nicely, except, uh, you know, I think this is a, this is a great discussion. And I think it, it just reminded me in, in our small group as well, how we always kind of come back to individual stories and framing, which is important, but we don't have ways to sort of explain the system, the systems of wealth extraction, the, you know, so it becomes always about individual behavior, individual effort, individual wealth. And, you know, I think sort of giving, giving, giving credence to systems, public subsidies, government help, government laws that skewed the rules one way and the other. And so that's, I, I like what uh, Jennifer said too about the importance of just understanding history and challenging the sort of stories and academic narratives that, that sort of have populated this conversation about wealth and inequality. Um, so I think that is, and that is something we can each do. We can each try to tell true stories of how advantage or barriers have worked and give, give, uh, give, give personal stories to the, the way systems work. So anyway, thank you for including me and this was, this was really fun. Yeah, I love that personal stories of how the system works, like to really illustrate it for people where it doesn't feel like the system, you know, it's like, no, this is how it plays out in this person's life, this family's life. Yeah, I love that. Thank you so much, Jennifer, Chuck, Kanisha, for being with us and for all of you that have stuck around. I know so many folks watch the recording as well. So thank you also for watching and um, continuing to be active in this community. Again, we have episodes every two weeks ish. <laughs> so just, you know that you'll be on the email list. You'll get the takeaway email and you get all future invites. Thank you so much for your time and energy. And I hope you'll come back on October 4th and uh, future episodes as well. So take good care, everyone.